Thank you for staying with us. You're still watching The Breakfast on Plus TV Africa. It's time for our second hot topic, and we're talking about the available resources for autism in Nigeria. Now, April is known as the Awareness Month for Autism. And joining me to have a conversation is Shalakpe Azazi. She's a qualified autism services practitioner, supervisor, and founder of Cradle Lounge Special Needs Initiative. Good morning, and thank you for coming. Good morning. Thank you for having me. It's lovely seeing you. Okay, so we're talking about autism in Nigeria. Now, I know that one of the sustainable development goals for the United Nations is to ensure that, you know, people enjoy health, right? And so since we're talking about health and it's Autism Awareness Month, I think this is such a great time to have this conversation. Absolutely. Yeah, so now there are lots of people who are autistic, even though sometimes you don't know, right? But let's just talk about the prevalence of autism in Nigeria and um, the awareness of this. So how do, we, how do you even know if you, have, if you are autistic or if your child has autism? So the prevalence of this and the awareness as well. Okay, so I'll take it one at a time. Yeah. So if, we were, if we're going to talk about prevalence of autism, even if we do not have the right data and statistics, I do know that some research was conducted in 2017 and um, part of what was um, concluded from the research, um, I think by China Nata and um, also by Dr. Majid Belo, was that they identified that um, out of um, um, three, um, out of I think there's 2.9 percent of um, autism prevalence from the study that they conducted in some mainstream schools in southeastern. Um, part of Nigeria and part of what they realized was that there was um, a big gap in in terms of social policy um, awareness and even intervention resources for autism in Nigeria so we do have a big gap in terms of intervention and resources and in terms of prevalence because we do not have the right statistics I cannot say this percentage of Nigerians or this percentage of children you know, fall under these statistics. Mm -hmm. However, we can say that we have a high prevalence of um, autism amongst them um, ages 2 to 18, mm -hmm. based on the study that was conducted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, what was the second question? The Sorry, I got lost. Like, how do you... Yes, so the awareness, well, that's why um, there's World Autism um, Awareness Month, which is April. So the awareness is starting to pick up because, you know, we have a lot of people coming out to talk about it, to you know, keep bringing awareness to it. Sadly, um, when you go to the um, rural area, people still believe that autism is something caused by evil spirit or mm. is something. So you still have those kind of, um, you still have to still keep debunking those myths and, mm. you know, you still have to keep talking about it. We don't have a lot of government intervention in this space to drive the conversation. Mm. So, you know, we still have, and that's why, why I said that we still have a lot of gap with social policies involved mm -hmm. in this area mm -hmm. yeah so speaking about debunking myths i mean some people would say that um on the spectrum it might mm -hmm. just the condition might be a mental disorder right do you think that is true so it's not a mental disorder um uh, I, I can understand why they think that because um um autism diagnosis fall under um, dsm-5 um, which is um, a mental diagnosis um, okay. however it's not a mental disorder according to um, dr belu majid's um, research he did identify that 50 percent of um, half of the people that he did the research with he found out that um, half of the people with autism also have comorbidity of intellectual disability and so people can easily think, oh, because you have an intellectual disability, then that means that you're retarded or mm -hmm. something. But it doesn't translate to you being retarded. You, you can have autism and still go ahead to live a fulfilled life mm -hmm. with, correct in, with the proper intervention put in place. So that's a myth that needs to be debunked. It's not a mental disorder. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have anything to do with your mental faculty of reasoning and mm -hmm. all of that. It's just the intervention that needs to be put in place to help you live a fulfilled life mm. yeah 
I love that. The fact that it's at least that is one myth that needs to be debunked because a lot of people just ride with it. Oh, you're disabled. You're mm. not thinking well. Mm. Something is wrong with your brain. Um, and so at least now we're, we're knowing that it is not a mental disorder. You're mm -mm. still fine. You're still okay. And you can live that big, beautiful life that you want. Absolutely. But let's talk about some challenges because I want to believe that if you're living with autism, um, there might just be some challenges for the person or even their family members. So what sort of challenges do these people face? Okay, so um, there are three major characteristics of, um, of, of autism. You have the social interaction and social communication. You have the repetitive and restrictive behavior. And so when you have those things, it affects the way I interact with you. It mm -hmm. affects my communication pattern and all of those things. So a child or an individual with autism still struggles with how to communicate his needs, his wants, how to interact with the society. And so that is where the role of intervention, that's the role of intervention. That's what it plays there. Because mm -hmm. when we are able to intervene in those areas, then the child or the individual can live a complete, fulfilled life. But mm -hmm. then when we do not have those, uh, those um, areas of challenges haven't been addressed, then you see a child that has those issues grow up to become an adult. Mm -hmm. And you, you know, because you didn't have any intervention, done as a child you're still growing with those challenges and those challenges are what now affects the way you view you interact mm -hmm. with the world around you interact with your environment yes mm -hmm. okay so i was going to ask um obviously interacting with the world right how do you even get diagnosed with autism so because there's no physical marker you know with down syndrome you have a physical marker with autism there's no physical marker so you for a diagnosis to take place, you have to do a multidisciplinary assessment. So what do I mean? You have your, um, if it's um, if you're looking at it from a child's angle, you need your um, pediatrician, the child's doctor. You need um, you need evaluation with your speech, um, your speech pathologist is involved because they have to check, you know, all the apparatus that would you know bring about speech mm. communication. Is it functioning? Does delayed I, speech happen in this sometimes? Well. Delayed speech is a sign of okay. autism, okay. but it is not um, a confirmation that you have autism. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? Because a lot of times you see that children are misdiagnosed because you say, oh, I have delayed speech and so automatically I have mm. autism. No, you need a multidisciplinary um, 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 par uh, professional to actually diagnose that you need your speech therapist, you need your, um, you need your psychologist, you need your... Um, you need a child's doctor to be able to rule out that it's not any physiological issue going on mm. that is affecting the child before you can give um, a, a diagnosis of X, Y, and Z. Yeah. Mm. Okay, so now if you're going to be diagnosed, right, do you think the Nigeria the Nigerian healthcare system kind of like support this? Because how many people, for instance, if you go to the rural areas, like we said, some of them will tell you, ah, evil spirits or <laughs> my, my village people have come for me yeah. and come for my child yeah. but the nigerian healthcare system do you think they support um you know just making sure that you know what is what exactly is wrong and if your child is autistic how does the nigerian healthcare system support this cause so you see we um we and and that's the conversation we're having and that's why we're driving awareness because a lot of times you you have the misdiagnosis that I talked about. You mm -hmm. have people that say, oh, uh, you know, once I have my child, I don't go to the hospital until I'm sure that, or until I notice that something is wrong. Mm -hmm. However, with autism, early diagnosis is key. And so you do the, um, if you're doing the regular milestone checks, you are checking, okay, at this time, my child should be talking, my child should be walking. Mm -hmm. You know, all those things, if you're really going and following through the system, then you can actually note at what time, this is, you know, this there's something wrong. Yeah. And then at that point, your doctors then refer you for further, you know, checkup mm -hmm. or further assessment done and all mm -hmm. of that. But a lot of times we don't, we get um, children coming in for um, assessment and diagnosis at age five, mm -hmm. at age six. At, do you understand? So they've missed out. It's when the child is ready for school and then they realize that, oh, the child is not doing as the child should be doing. It's not, you know functioning in the mm -hmm. in the way so when is, is the best time to to go for that diagnosis as soon as you notice that your child is not following the developmental milestones set up set up for the child mm -hmm. for example children as um we've noticed that you can even start to find markers for autism as young as 12 months that's just like a year 
Yes, because if um, I talked about social interaction, I talked about social communication. A lot of times you, when you say that in public, they are expecting that it's me and you talking or me and you interacting with the environment. But with a baby, if a child cannot track a point mm -hmm. and you can't track, that's something. Mm -hmm. You are not interacting with your environment. If I call your name and you don't respond, at 12 months, your child should be able to respond to the name. So yeah. if I say, oh, Shalakbe, and my child is not responding, Shalakbe, Shalakbe, I should immediately know that that is a, a red flag. Mm. And I should be talking to my child's doctor at that point saying, look, oh, I tried to call my child, but he's not responding to his name. And then they are checking to see that I hope it's not something wrong with the ears. Caring. That's, where you, that's mm -hmm. where you have the, doctor, the child's doctor checking for physiological signs. Mm. That is, is his hearing good? There's nothing blocking it and all of those are the physiological signs. So if they are ruling it out, then they are checking. Is there something going on there? And then they are immediately, you know, putting that child into another, you know, they're flagging the child for further assessment. Mm. So you see how they are trying to catch it early on. Because once you catch it early on, you can intervene, you can put the right intervention in place and that child will thrive. Mm. Okay. So let's talk about available resources because that's even what this conversation is supposed to be about. Yeah. What sort of available resources do we have in Nigeria? Support systems, therapies. Um, I know there are some NGOs just like yours, you know, that are championing this cause and making sure that people who are living um, with autism live that a fulfilled life. Yeah. But for the government we expect the government to be doing something in the healthcare system so what sort of what sort of available resources do we have in nigeria for things like this sadly we don't have enough and even the very few is like you said it's quite sad because even your <laughs> voice went low at that point like <laughs> you could just hear it it's not even about your words it's just well oh. yeah because yeah. when you look at um therapy is expensive Mm -hmm. everywhere in the world yeah. and I tell people because they say oh no it's not expensive you know the jackpot syndrome you see people saying oh I'm taking my kids abroad because I want to be able to yeah. give the best services it's available there but at a cost you know but then they know that you know to an extent the government is covering certain costs yeah but here we don't have therapy is expensive and you're paying out of pockets you know imagine you're telling a mother of for children that two of your children are on the spectrum and then they need support they need intervention they need speech therapy they need um ot they need this they need that too and then she looks at you and says i earn thirty thousand now i'm sorry <laughs> minimum wage you know that's the minimum i'm just yeah mm -hmm. minimum wage i earn thirty thousand you tell me my child needs therapy how and then they say okay well the if you go to um the public facilities that um you can get um, support mm -hmm. and then they go to the public hospitals um, a few of them that have some sort of support that they say they have which is maybe speech and whatever intervention that they're giving mm -hmm. they give it once a month or once in one quarter okay. and then the person has to okay for example i do know that there's a center in oshodi that offers free um speech therapy and, mm -hmm. but then the time that they have to queue for that service then the fact that some it's not is not easily a, a, available you have people coming from badagri just to wow. access that service in oshodi in oshodi wow and then they will have left their houses maybe 4 a.m to make sure that they are there for a 10 a.m 30 minutes appointment and then the next time they're having another appointment is in six months time or in three months time if they are lucky now they are already not they are disenfranchised mm -hmm. because i've come all the way and they are not seeing progress because of already they are stressed out mm -hmm. so i feel pretty much not enough resources i think mm -hmm. let me just put it <laughs> that i just painted mm -hmm. a clear picture of what it is yeah. like to access even the barest minimum services not enough resources and most times you find out that you have to then now go into private and yeah. then private ones are expensive. expensive right how many people can afford that yeah and then you have very few ngos supporting that but then it's just a lot yeah it's a lot so what do you think the government can do right now to ensure even with research and development because that's also a critical area absolutely so what can the government do right now what policies you know if you were to advise the government what policies will have to be in place to just ensure that because 
it's one of the sustainable development goals. In fact, it should be for like every nation, every country to ensure that, you know, you're because if you don't have people living, you don't have a nation if you think about Absolutely. it. So if you were to advise the government, what kind of policies would you think they should put in place? I think we need to first start with sensitization. We need to put more policies in the area of, you know, first desensitizing what they think it is and mm -hmm. then building more awareness. So in every healthcare facility, for example, things like this should be a common thing, mm. you know, a common discussion. You have healthcare, um, each health, um, I think, I think they call those units, anyways, yeah. they would already, as your child, they're following through your child's development. Mm -hmm. If I've had a child here, they're insisting that when you come for immunization, they're checking yes. all those things mm -hmm. because that is how you can even track it easily. Mm -hmm. They're doing the, as they're doing the immunization, they're asking the right questions, they're flagging it down, they're educating those, those parents coming yeah. in that, okay, these are the things we're checking for. Mm. Because sometimes the parents don't even know what it is that they're supposed to be so, coming to yeah, talk about. Yeah. And or even the checkers, what's the They don't even know what the checkers are. Mm -hmm. You know, it's when it's like, I can't, you know, but then when you say things, because I'm sure if I tell you social interaction and communication, like I said, you wouldn't even have thought that that is a major thing. Yeah. But I would say to you as you come in, ah, so when I call your child, does he listen? Does he this? You know, those Asking questions. Those questions. And then it comes with sensitization of the healthcare units. You know, we're mm. going in, we're talking to them. This is what you're asking for. When you see a mother come in, this is how you talk. This is, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. And then you go into the school system because a lot of them are already in, you know, you go into public schools. Some of them have grown already with living with that. And again, that's another thing because you've locked, the, you have parents that have locked up their children all through the year and then they now, they're adults. You can't lock up an adult anymore. Mm -hmm. And then the adult is in the society. And what are the, what are the interventions we're putting in for them? Mm. That's a good question. You know, we have adults on the spectrum. What are the interventions, you know, okay, we might say, okay, maybe um, empowerment. or What, mm -hmm. what are the interventions? What are the housing facilities we're putting in place for them? Because, again, the parents that are taking care of those, they are getting old. They, they are going yeah. to be left on their own. Oh. So it's a lot yeah. of things. So that's why I said social policies, you know, to address this issue. Yeah. Government needs to put more effort mm. into areas of things like that because it's when we do that that we can make it. Um, well, hopefully <laughs> I we can. I know, I know you're doing your bit as well. Um, you have... A you have an NGO that, you know, also help and support. So let's just talk about that as we wrap up. How do you help people, regardless of the government doing their own bits? How are, um, you know, private people also helping? So um, what we do is we do a lot of fundraising. Um, um, I recently did um, a mini um, documentary just to show what um, it, autism in Nigeria really looks like. Mm -hmm. So we talked to caregivers we talk so we do things like that I, I i focus a lot of my attention on advocacy mm. so we go into schools we talk about autism we write children's book to help children understand what autism is about mm -hmm. you know things like that those are the kind of things that my ngo do we we support and then when we see families that are struggling with you know this intervention we try to see ways where we can give them you know do the stop gap mm -hmm. for them just to make sure that they have the barest minimum that they can use to support their children. Mm. We also train parents because, again, we understand that funds can be limited. Yeah. But when you as a parent know how to do certain things to help your child within the home front, it makes the job lighter. So those are the things that we do. That is amazing. <laughs> that is amazing. You thank are amazing. You. Thank I you want, very to say, much. want to say thank you for um, all that you're doing. Thank you. Good work. Thank you. Um, I wish you all the best. And I hope that, you know, more families are blessed um, through you and all the other people that are championing this cause. Thank, thank you, you very so much. much. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. All right. That's it for the show today. We'll be speaking with Sholakwe Azazi. And we've just been talking about the available resources for autism in Nigeria. This is the size of the show. This is where we have to wrap it up. I want to say thank you for having a breakfast with us today. I'll see you again tomorrow. My name is Rume Paulson. Have an amazing day.